you're, are you first before me? Oh my Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rick Honenberg, and I serve on the Board of Trustees of the Unitarian Church of uh, Spartan this year. And I first of all, I'd like to have Mitch Eisner. And I don't know whether we need Palma. Come on up here, Mitch. He has announcements for y'all. Good morning, everybody. OK, as you know, we had the auction last night. And thank you all for coming and contributing. We took in, as of last night, $14,500. Okay. Now, this is the eighth year Palmer and I have done it, and each year we've done 15000 or above, and during the previous seven years, we've taken in 114000 So I'm hoping and counting on all of you to bring us up to 15000 and you have opportunity to do so. We have additional spots on uh, the bulletin board there for more opportunities for you to sign up for dinners, games, fellowship and fun. Um, so do so, sign your name, write out a check, put it in the envelope, and help us to get to the 15,000 mark. Um, we also have some stuff in the general store downstairs. Uh, your best offer will take home whatever is left over, okay? So you can come down after services and uh, get some, yourself some bargains. Um, it really takes a village to make this sanctuary our home and to keep it flourishing and to keep the auction every year to be successful. So I just want to thank a number of people. The, first of all, all of you who donated uh, merchandise, uh, had the idea of dinners or trips or whatever, uh, is a great way for people to get together and have fun and fellowship. So I want to thank the donators and the bidders. Uh, the setup and cleanup committee, I want to thank you, all of you who helped out for that. The tech people who helped out with all of our computers. The bartenders who made sure that you had enough drinks to spend money. Uh, the people who helped out in the general store. The auctioneers. and. Um, Every village needs a queen, and I want to make, give special thanks to the queen of the auction, uh, Palmer, who, for the past couple of weeks, who has been <laughs> working so hard to get all of your donations on the computer spreadsheet to make those little signs, you know, for sign up and to give the certificates when you uh, uh, made your bid and got what you wanted. So thank you all for another successful auction, and <laughs> bravo to all of you. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Palma, for all the work you did on that. Um, we also would like to welcome today Mark Burroughs, and he's the executive director of the Challenge. The Challenge Incorporated is a, uh, a harm reduction organization that provides services to drug users to keep both users and the community safe, including providing clean needles, Narcon, and, and uh, connecting people with recovery services. Challenge. Challenges is on the forefront of the opioid crisis. We share the plate 
uh, this Sunday and, and, uh, and next to the benefit of this critical work. And, and Mark will be talking a little bit later about his organization. Uh, our annual uh, winter solstice celebration will take place on Friday evening, December 21st in this sanctuary. All are invited, come at 545 uh, to a drum circle to begin the evening festivities. The solstice uh, observant uh, will begin at 6.30 p.m. This is a service for all ages in which we will pass through the darkness of the longest night of the year together. Now, if you're visiting, I see that I'm not going to be able to show you some things. If you're visiting for the first time or after a long hiatus, I, uh, I welcome you. And if you uh, would like to stand and maybe tell us your name and who you are, we'll maybe have a chance to greet you better at coffee after the service. Anybody feel brave as a guest today? No braveness, I understand. Oh, we got one? Oh. I have a loud voice. I, I'm Greta. I'm friends with Mel and Mark. Anybody else? too tall, I couldn't see that high. I am Mark, and I am also friends with Mel. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. You've given Fred some exercise today, that's good. Uh, there is a visitor's card in the pocket of the, in the, in the chair in front of you, and if you like, uh, please fill out and put it in the offering plate. Um, we also offer a visitor's packet uh, at, at the counter in the foyer. So if you do have some interest in looking further at, at, at this religious society, uh, please stop by and get one after the service. And join us in the fellowship uh, hall and take a moment, you know, uh, today for coffee and conversation. And as we move into our time of worship, Please take some, a moment to silence your cell phone. Uh, let us bring our full attention to being here together. And, and thanks so much for being uh, here today. And one other, one other thing that I need to mention, the children's choir, okay, will be meeting after the service in room three. Is that right, Aaron? Yep. Yep. Good. Good morning. What a relaxing weekend we have had here. <laughs> On Friday afternoon, I started getting phone calls from some folks that were coming to this sanctuary for a wedding rehearsal. And we were here for quite some time, walking through how to recess and process all of those things that you do in some of those kinds of rehearsals, and kids just running through the sanctuary around and around and around. It was total chaos and a lot of fun. And then on Saturday morning, before it was time to be here for wedding and auction, I started getting phone calls from other folks that needed to get into the church to do this, that, or the other, and uh, who were in conflict with each other because they wanted to do so much here at the same time. I felt really bad for everybody involved, but it was a fabulous problem to behold, right? Everybody trying to get in and get in on top of each other. Then a wedding in which only two people with any connection to this church were present. One, obligatorily me. <laughs> Some things just have to happen. The other, David Freeman, who on his birthday came to help a family hold a wedding. Any wedding is important, but this one was a turning point for this couple. They were changing their lives. It's not my place to elaborate, but 
it was a profoundly considered decision on the part of these two people to bind themselves to one another in a covenant. And this is the place where they wanted to do it. And David Friedman gave up his birthday afternoon to make that happen. And then the antics of the evening began. I so appreciate Mitch and Rick and everyone else dragging themselves here this morning after what I saw you do last night. Thank you for the energy that you are pouring into this place. It is more than work and it's more than service. As someone said to me last night, I have never had so much fun in a church. <laughs> so this is winter and December in a time of celebrations. Let's celebrate. Thank you. That was beautiful and happy Hanukkah to everyone. Okay, at this point, I would like to invite all of you to come up and grab a stone or a shell and hold it to your heart and place it in the bowl. If you have a concern, that will be spread throughout our congregation and we will share it with you. And if you have a joy, we would like to share that with you too.
Good morning. I don't think this is on. Good morning. Can everyone hear? Yeah. Or not? Yeah. Well, I'd like to, there we go. I'd like to invite everybody, all the children to come forward in a circle in front of me. Young children, grown up children, whatever you want, come forward. Well, good morning again, everyone. So I know you all know the answer to this, but who can tell me what this is? Our chalice. And what does it stand for? What does it mean to you? Have any idea? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, Marlis? Light in the world. Very good. Any, any other ideas? Riley? The light of the sun. From everybody's joys. Is that what you said? Okay. Any other ideas? That our church? Yeah, it is kind of a symbol of our church. Well, let me show you a couple things. I found some pictures of some, there's all different kinds of chalices. There's this one, like we use in one of our classrooms. <coughs> There's the one that's over here to my left that we use in the sanctuary. And here's a few others that I thought were just kind of interesting. They're all different kinds of designs for chalices. Some of them go on cloth. Some of them are ones that would stand on a table, like this one. But they all have a flame, right? They all have light in some way. And this is one that's in some stained glass. So it gets the sunlight coming through that one. Yeah, comes through the glass. And then this one was kind of one of my favorites because it had the hands around the chalice. And that reminded me of what we say in our classroom when we light our chalices, that we are the people of the open hearts and the helping hands. Yeah, Riley. Uh-huh. That's possible. That's possible. There are a lot of people that have designed different kinds of chalices. Well, I don't know if you knew this or not, but our chalice actually has a story to it. Um, before the chalice became a symbol of our church, it was used as the symbol for something called the Unitarian Service Committee. And that started back in 1940, long before you guys were born, um, even before I was born, um, about 80 years ago. And it was utilized in Europe at a time when there was a terrible war going on. And when people saw the chalice symbol, they knew it was a place they could come to for help. It especially became a symbol for the Jewish people who was a group of people that were treated, one of many groups of people that were treated very badly during this war. And they knew it would be a safe place to go wherever they saw the symbol of the chalice. So for those people, the chalice meant safety and help. I like to think of our chalice as a cup of light. They're all, most of them have kind of a cup shape like that, right? And when we light the flame, even this one, it's not a real flame, but it's still a light. I feel like we're spreading light out into the world, as some of you already said. In the winter especially, candlelight is really nice, isn't it? I bet maybe, uh, maybe a couple hours after you get home from school these days, it's already dark, isn't it? So it's nice to have some candlelight. It does. 
It does, because this one is blinking a little bit, so it actually almost looks like a real flame. So what do you think? Can we send this light out into the world? How do you think we could do that? Right? By doing kind things. Right? So Riley was basically saying charity, ways we can help other people, make them feel safe, those kinds of things. Henry, you had something? Being kind. Yeah. Really? Did you remember? If you think of it, you can say it later. Okay. Anybody else have any other ideas? Well, something that, and those are all wonderful ideas. Does somebody else have something that I missed? Yeah, Marlins? I'm sorry? Being a good person. I like that. That's a very good way to send light out into the world. Well, one way in the Jewish tradition, um, since we're starting to celebrate Hanukkah today, I thought I would explain this to you, too. When you light candles in the Jewish tradition, you actually blow not blow, but sort of wave your hands lightly over the candlelight, and that's to spread the, the light and the blessings out into the world. And so that, to me, is a really special way to share our light into the world. So we've talked about it. So now we know that the chalice means many things to all of us, right? It can be something different to everybody, but I think... The main thing that we're saying here is that it means be kind, be nice, to think of other people. Um, could it also mean maybe giving a gift to someone out in the world that might need it, like Riley was saying, like charity to others? Yeah. Like we're doing at our church right now. Yes, we do that all year long, but we do it a lot at the holidays too. Yeah. Not littering, and that and that and that's actually a good thing because putting part of putting the light to the world is taking care of our world and taking care of the earth. That's a very good thought too. Thank you. So I'd like you to do something with me um, before we go back to class, and we're going to actually raise our hands like we have. Just pretend there's a big flame right in front of us here, and we're going to gently wave that light into the room out into the building, and out into the world around us. Okay. So if we can stand and make an archway, we're going to sing the children back to class. <laughs> And now I invite you all to read our covenant, which is inside either of your hymnals, clipped in the front. We are a people of faith and hope. Together we covenant to strive to become our better selves, to honor both the critical mind and the generous heart to prove that diversity need not mean divisiveness, 
and to respond to systems of violence and oppression with the power of love beyond belief. And now just look around the room and maybe there's someone you'd like to greet who you haven't met yet or someone you haven't seen in a while. Greet each other. And now if you would join me in our responsive reading in our hymnal page 629, Hanukkah Lights. I will begin and then you will respond with the italics. We gather in the chill of winter solstice, finding warmth from each other, nourishing hope where reason fails. Holy One of Blessing, your presence fills creation. Holy One of Blessing, your presence fills creation. Holy One of Blessing, your presence fills creation. We share the plate this month on behalf of Challenges, Inc. 
And we have with us today the Executive Director of Challenges, Inc., who, as I understand it, is also the only person who works for Challenges, Inc. <laughs> and to call him Executive Director is to suggest that he gets paid for this, which he doesn't. This is a purely voluntary endeavor. Mark Burroughs is going to speak with us, but before he does, I want to indicate the importance and the bravery of what he does. There are many states with laws that provide for needle exchanges and other public health measures to pre prevent the spread of further disease and to try to mitigate the effects of drug use, both for users and their families and their communities. What Mark does in South Carolina is not against the law, but there is no legal provision to protect him in what he does, contrary to other states. This is a person working out of the back of their car to face down a massive epidemic in our country. I'd like to welcome Mark Burroughs to speak about his work. Good morning. <laughs> Mike check. Uh, my name is Mark Burroughs. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I started Challenges Inc. about two years ago. And uh, we are a harm reduction service. We operate um, mostly in the upstate. Um, and what harm reduction means is basically not encouraging drug use, but trying to minimize the risks associated with drug use and the consequences that come from it. So part of what we do is um, we supply clean syringes and other supplies to stop the spread of disease, mostly HIV and hepatitis, and um, try to minimize emergency room visits um, and preventing it before it starts. Um, we also uh, distribute a drug called naloxone, and for people who aren't familiar, naloxone is a, a drug that reverses the effects of an opioid overdose. Um, and uh, thankfully, we've had uh, several of ours already um, save some lives with that. Um, and then I think my favorite part of the work is we, we kind of act as a bridge from addiction or drug use into recovery or treatment. Um, so it's a, it's, we're a mobile syringe exchange unit. We, we're out on the streets, we make deliveries, we do outreach, and we kind of go to the person in need instead of waiting for them to come to us. So um, I am the, uh, the only one that really uh, works, for, works for Challenges, Inc. Um, we do have a couple volunteers that are starting to help, and, and I'm trying to find ways to get more people involved. Um, the great thing about Challenges, Inc. is we're 100% uh, volunteer run, and um, all of our funds go to supplies. Uh, luckily, supplies are fairly inexpensive, so um, any funding we get goes a long way. Um, I've been supporting most of it uh, this, this whole time just uh, with my own funds. So um, the work is, is fairly inexpensive, which is great. Um, I could go on forever. I'm so thankful to be here and, and for Mel uh, putting my name in the hat, per se. Um, um, and I, I just can't thank you enough for, I don't know, I guess I should say being open-minded enough to, to allow me to engage in this work. Um, it can be a little, uh, it's not for everyone, I guess I should say. So, uh, <laughs> um, 
but thank you so much for, for having me. And this is amazing being here. And um, I feel like really emotional sitting over there as I watch this whole thing. So um, I don't know, it's, it's, this is a great experience. So thank you so much. The story of Hanukkah is of a small band of people trying to heal a deep fissure in their society. And the core story is of a small container of oil to light a lamp in the temple, a vial of oil not enough for even a short span of time, which miraculously extends over eight days. A small amount can go very far. Fuel this fire. My understanding is that Cindy Freeman thought she had retired from the clarinet in seventh grade. 
for the risks that we are all willing to take to do things that really matter, to play the clarinet and the piano, to fight back against the opioid crisis, that's real. I'm very grateful. It is my privilege to speak with folks who are joining this congregation or who are considering joining this congregation or who just like to visit sometimes. And over and over again, people talk about what it is like the first time they read our covenant. We talked about it earlier today. We recited it together. This wonderful statement that we say together. In fact, why don't we pull it out and say it again now? It's there in the front of, in a very UU way, any hymnal of your choosing. <laughs> say it with me. We are people of faith and hope. Together we covenant to strive to become our better selves to honor both the critical mind and the generous heart, to prove that diversity need not mean divisiveness, and to systems of violence and oppression with the power of a love beyond belief. This is a beautiful statement of how we strive to live, how we choose to live, a standard that we set for ourselves. It's not a creed. There was an interesting conversation in our fellowship hall about a year ago, a gathering of new members in which we talked about exactly how a covenant is not at all a creed. A creed is something that you say you believe. I believe this. A covenant is something older. It's not about belief at all, although we may develop beliefs around it. Covenant is about what we will do. It's about practice. And particularly practice in relationship to someone else. Covenant is a decision to bind with another. And it's a binding that is more than contractual. When we form a covenant with someone, we engage in a deeper level of relationship. What we're saying is, no matter what you do, I will remain faithful to you. A covenant is not contingent on the other person's actions. It's premised on the fact that I value you and so will remain with you. This is a very deep relationship. To choose another person in this way. And then to commit to live that. Tonight begins the celebration of Hanukkah. And this Sunday and also next Sunday, we are going to celebrate and to observe the Festival of Lights. I want to be clear about what we're doing. We're not doing a mimicry of Hanukkah here. We're not trying to impersonate a Hanukkah celebration. That would be disingenuous and insulting. We are here to celebrate. We have members of our congregation who are Jewish, who have Jewish heritage, who find in this celebration something of great meaning, great connection to family and to history and to what is most important in this world. And because we are in covenant with them, we want to celebrate with them. And more than that, this is a chance for us to honor a tradition which has been profoundly formative to all of us, whether we know it or not, to give thanks for a tradition that has persisted and thrived in great adversity and to our great benefit, whether we know it or not. And in addition to celebrating with and honoring, this is a chance, frankly, to push back. 
to resist, to show solidarity. We live in a time in the West of rising anti-Semitism. And this is an opportunity as a congregation, however much we fumble a passage, mess up a story, miss a note, however much we don't quite get it right, it is a chance for us to say, we are against that. And we are with these brothers and sisters, these fellow citizens. We may be awkward in our expression, but we are serious in it too. This week, I want to ask us especially to consider a gift that we have all received from the Jewish tradition, the gift of covenant. It is foundational to this congregation, to how we understand ourselves, and to the Unitarian Universalist tradition. We are exactly not creedal, but deeply covenantal. Hire any UU consultant that you want. Import them to your board retreat. And I guarantee you, they are gonna ask you to write a covenant. <laughs> that is their go-to move. In my year and a half with you, I've written like three or four covenants. It's deep in the ethos of this movement. And so I want us to think about where that comes from. You shall live. These are the words that are spoken by the prophet Moses to the Hebrew people as they are forming into the nation of Israel at the moment of their formation in the book of Deuteronomy, in the Torah, in the Hebrew Bible. Moses has given them the covenant, the rules by which they should live, not just to be rule followers, not just a legal code to stay on the narrow, we don't say the straight and narrow here, but it's stay on the narrow. <laughs> I've listened to you, Linda. <laughs> Always forward, never straight. <laughs> Moses gives them the Torah, the commandments of God. And the blessing, if they will follow those commandments, is a promise. You shall live. Follow this agreement, this relationship. Live in this relationship, and you shall live. And so today, to begin this Hanukkah celebration, I want to express gratitude for the gift of covenant. It comes from that moment in the story of the Hebrew people, even before they called themselves Israel, as they took shape. That is where this idea comes from. And then also, as an act of gratitude and honor, in the tradition of scholarship and analysis, of thinking, that is another tremendous gift of Judaism to Western culture. A gift to which any of us who are or have been students, teachers, lawyers, writers, readers, doctors, scientists, psychologists, therapists, storytellers, anyone who thinks critically about what it means to live and live in a relationship with other people. We are indebted to the profound intellectual tradition of Judaism. And in that tradition of thinking together on the riddles of how we should live this life. We should question this practice of covenant. We should ask of it what it means, what it asks of us. And thirdly, in a time of rising anti-Semitism in the West, in North America and in Europe, we have a moral obligation. We have a duty to our Jewish brothers and sisters to acknowledge and to praise, 
to consider this gift we have received from them and their forebears. It is one of the grotesque ironies of our life and of our history that so many who owe such a debt to Judaism act with such disregard and violence towards it. It is an obscenity. You shall live. Such a beautiful promise. Live in covenant and you shall live. But after something like the shooting, the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, we must ask, really? And we can think of so many other examples. Sybil, who herself shares with us her own heritage in this tradition, has mentioned already just the history of the 20th century, and only a portion of that. And we know that this goes much further back. If there are those here who believe in divinity, the lives of those unjustly lost should cause us grave questioning. We should be honest and brave enough to ask why those practicing the covenant on a Saturday morning, nevertheless lost their lives. And if we do not believe in divinity, but nonetheless value covenantal living, as we do in this congregation, we should remember that it is by the story of the Jewish people, a story for which those 11 people died, that we have received this gift of covenant that we value so much. You shall live. It does not seem to be any way to rely on that promise, given all that has happened in our history. But I believe, I deeply believe in spite of all of my training and my mystical experiences and my inner religious encounters and my own long search for truth through all of that, which I greatly value, I deeply believe that the question of God and the fulfillment of God's promises is not really the point of these stories. The point of the story of covenant of which we are beneficiaries, it's not really about God. It is about us. The point is how we choose to live. Stories of God are very often really stories about us, about how we choose. And the measure of our lives is in large part based on what we choose to do in relationship with one another. It is as if the character of God, whatever we think of that character, in all of these stories, both from the Jewish tradition and far beyond, is holding up a mirror to us to ask what we will do. The point of covenant is how we choose to act in relationship with one another. Put in the simplest, most urgent, and unfortunately very contemporary terms, will we choose for one another to live? Will we live in relationship with one another so that we may live at all? Consider the opioid crisis in our country. Yesterday was World AIDS Day. And only a few days ago, a report was published which documented that drug-related deaths last year in this country surpassed deaths due to HIV at the high point of the AIDS epidemic. That is not to diminish those who 
have lived with and died from HIV. Not at all. It is to say how serious the situation is today with the opioid crisis. Opioid deaths surpass deaths by gun violence in our country, which is not to diminish the gravity of the problem of gun violence, but to indicate the escalation of deaths due to the opioid crisis. On the same day that that report came out, it kept popping up on my push notifications on my phone. Every periodical that I've got logged into my iPhone kept headlining this story. On the same day, I heard a story of two people living with addiction, two people caught in the grip of this crisis. One of them had been to see a doctor and had a dose of Narcan, that drug that Mark was telling us about that can reverse the effects of an overdose. And they encountered another person who was ODing. Two addicts, one ODing, and one with a dose of Narcan. And the one administered it to the other. And this is a terrible situation. One that I don't wish on anyone. But how profound to be caught in the grip of this thing and to have what saves the life of another person caught in that same grip. And think about what we've heard Mark say today. He had to stoop so low to get his head to the microphone that he cut all of his stories short. (laughs) When he says that he could go on, I believe him. Can you imagine what he's seen out of the back of his car? Can you imagine the conversations that he's had and the ones that he hasn't had that he wished he had had? We can ask ourselves in that rich intellectual tradition we have been gifted by Judaism of critical inquiry, inquiry for the sake of asking how we will live and how we will live in relationship with one another. We can ask, have pharmaceutical companies chosen to live in covenant with us? What is the relationship they desire to have with us? Have they chosen life? What about Challenges Inc? No legal protection in this state. No salary for the laborer. Have they chosen to live in covenant relationship with us? What if you were the user and you needed a needle? Has Challenges Inc. chosen life? Who put that Narcan in the hand of the person who was using and who came to the rescue of their friend? And what about those two people, those two people living with addiction, one giving Narcan to the other. Were they living in covenant? Have they chosen life? You shall live. Covenant is about how we choose to live in a relationship with one another especially in what is so difficult and deadly. And in the old stories, stories that we've inherited, stories that come to us as a gift, whether we believe them or not, covenant is not about what you believe. It's about life. In the old stories, we hear a promise fulfilled over and over again by those who choose to be faithful to one another. Choose one another. Choose to live in deep relationship, no matter what the other does, 
Choose them in faithfulness, in covenant, and you shall live. We all shall. Please take your gray hymnals and turn to number 221, the old Peter, Paul, and Mary song, Light One Candle. Stand for the benediction. We are a people of faith and hope.